fringe theories I understand as being views that aren't taken very seriously amongst professional scientists. The idea with using a pluralist approach is not just to like, you know, be covering all our bases and, you know, make sure we're including the theory that ends up being the one true theory. Um, the idea is uh, that uh, pluralism is permanent. You know, I get a lot of pushback, but uh, mostly from people who are like on board with the general idea. Like what I get pushback on is like kind of the things you were giving me some pushback on. Like, really, we should include everyone. This is Brain Inspired. I'm Paul Middlebrooks, and I am less of a pluralist than my guest today, Laura Gradowski. Laura is a philosopher of science at the University of Pittsburgh. Pluralism, or scientific pluralism anyway, is roughly the idea that there is no unified account of any scientific field, and that we should be tolerant of and uh, welcome a variety of theoretical and conceptual frameworks and methods and goals when doing science. Pluralism is kind of a buzzword right now in in my little neuroscience slash philosophy world, uh, but it's an old and well-trodden notion. Many philosophers have been calling for pluralism for many years. But how pluralistic should we be in our studies and explanations in science? Laura suggests we should be very, very, very <laughs> pluralistic. I, in the episode, I call it extreme pluralism or maybe radical pluralism. But to make her case, she cites examples in the history of science uh, of theories and theorists that were once considered quote-unquote fringe, but went on to become mainstream accepted theoretical frameworks and theorists. So I thought it would be fun to have her on to share her ideas uh, about fringe theories, mainstream theories, pluralism, etc. So even though this podcast is about neuroscience and AI and intelligence and all that jazz, we discuss a wide range of topics, but we also do discuss some specific to the brain and mind sciences. So, for example, Laura describes the trials and tribulations of something and someone that went from fringe to mainstream science, namely the Garcia effect, uh, named after John Garcia, whose findings went against the grain of behaviorism, which was a dominant dogma of the day in psychology uh, back 50, 60, 70 years ago. Um, but this overturning, going from fringe to mainstream, only happened after Garcia had to endure a long scientific hell of uh, his results being ignored and shunned. So there are multiple examples like that, and we discuss a handful. And this has led Laura to the conclusion that we should accept almost all theoretical frameworks. And we discuss her ideas about how to implement this, where to draw the line, and much more. So my thanks to Laura for hanging in there and uh, taking my probably annoying questions every once in a while. Thank you for listening and or watching. I link to Laura's information in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 179. 179. And thanks as always to those of you who support this podcast on Patreon. As some of you know who've uh, recently approached me when I've been at a conference to moderate a panel, etc., I feel so much appreciation uh, for your support and your kind words that um, I, I get chills when I meet you guys. And so I look forward to meeting more of you in the future and I uh, appreciate your support. All right, here's Laura. Where should we start? There's so many different places we could start. Just the word fringe. Is, is fringe a technical term? Um, so. Or are you making it into a technical term? I'm perhaps making it into a technical term, okay. um, but I'm trying to capture the way that we use it naturally. Okay. Yeah. I wonder how much of our conversation to, today is going to be about how we use words. And so, so, I mean, I'm so naive, so ignorant of philosophy, I guess, that I thought, well, maybe fringe is a technical term, but I never looked it up. So what, what to you is fringe and how did you come to be interested in studying the fringe? in science? Uh, yeah, great questions. Um, so fringe theories, uh, well, I talk about fringe theories and fringe science, um, but fringe theories specifically are just alternative views. Um, the way I used to define it was like very simply as just like this broad set of alternative views that go against what the consensus is amongst professional scientists. 
Though um, the trouble with that is like figuring out what consensus is. And um, on top of that, too, there's mainstream views that you might say are not consensus views. Oh, okay. Because in your dissertation, you it's kind of a battle between fringe and mainstream. That's, that's how I kind of pitted it in my own mind. I'm not sure if that was intentional. But consensus is a new one now for me. So keep arranging that for me. Because I, I, I thought you were going to talk about fringe versus mainstream. Yeah, I mean, that is, that, is the, that is the distinction. So, I mean, the way I see it now is um, as like on a continuum. So with fringe at one end and mainstream at the other end. Um, and where's consensus? And Sorry to interrupt. So consensus isn't, uh, consensus is probably somewhere over in the mainstream area. <laughs> okay. But um, it's, it's along that same continuum? It's not a multidimensional? No, oh. it would be multidimensional. Okay. So consensus would be... Since there are mainstream views that are not consensus views, you can't just say mainstream. You can't define mainstream theories as uh, the views about which professional scientists have consensus. Okay. Um, I mean, perhaps there could be like consensus about what mainstream views are, but that's another another thing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, and so uh, defining it uh, along a continuum allows for uh, borderline cases, um, and uh, it allows me to to like talk about super fringe and super mainstream. I, that's more tentative. Um, right. But so um, fringe theories, I understand um, as uh, being views that aren't taken very seriously amongst professional scientists. So um, one measure for that is, um, I call it like the sociological measure, which is uh, a theory's degree of absence in uh, the relevant disciplines, peer-reviewed journals or other forums for discourse. Okay. So um, there's like levels of fringe, right? You uh, you don't uh, have to go all the way uh, to totally absent uh, for a theory to count as fringe. But then you have to take into consideration the relevant power and um, uh, of the publications, right? If you're going to quantify something and maybe we can get in later to how to how to and whether to quantify fringe but you're already kind of talking about that so I, I, there's just so many different uh dimensions to how you would quantify fringe i guess and so you, you just mentioned like the, the relevant publications but how do you even define that and then you have do you have to like score them and take a weighted average sort of thing i mean we know what journals are like the top tier journals in a given discipline right so i mean we already I think we already have ideas for like what what would count. Okay. Um, but specifically, I think um, journals published with academic presses would be like where to look. Um, not, not not zines, <laughs> not the old zines. And the, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I think like being published in scientific, like a theory being published in Scientific American, for example, would be uh, pretty indicative that it was mainstream. Okay. Yeah. Or at least on its way on its way to mainstream. How does one? Like, did someone introduce you to the term fringe or the idea of fringe? Or was this on your radar beforehand? Or was this floating around in philosophy before? Like, how did how did it come about? Uh, so certainly not floating around in philosophy. Um, and, you know, I mean, not really in any scientific field. I mean, here and there, like, I, I did, like, heavy searches for the use of the term fringe mm. in philosophy papers. Found, like, a few uses um, here and there. Um, there are some papers like from sort of back in the day, like, I don't know, 1970s talking about uh, what fringe theories are, which is really cool. Oh. Um, but uh, all that has been like sort of lost and forgotten, at least in philosophy. Um, so, I mean, nobody told me to work on it. It's sort of uh, what I picked up was uh, really relevant um, amongst sort of like, I guess, in pop culture right now. Um, people are talking a lot about uh, the mainstream theories saying this and fringe theories saying that. And mm. um, I think people are really interested in fringe theories. Um, and I guess nobody had done this project of like looking at which fringe theories, um, or I mean, even like really will admit that fringe theories become mainstream. Like, so I went around like asking some philosophers what they thought about this idea. I had trouble getting people, like convincing people at first to like, uh, be my advisor on this project, um, but ultimately did. Uh, good old John Greenwood um, from CUNY uh, was supportive. I mean, it's juicy. 
the the, the topic yeah. it's 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 topical, right? With um, mm-hmm. the recent, you know, with disinformation campaigns and what's what's a truth, what's a fact, what's totally. not a fact, postmodernism, etc. So it's a juicy topic, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, we're like in this age of misinformation, right? Or um, and a lot of fringe theories are, I mean, dismissed as just being misinformation. But let's talk about some of the characteristics, and I'll ask you about some examples. People are probably wondering, like, what what, what theories is are they talking about? No, yeah. like, what? Give me some give me some examples. But before we do that, like, what are some characteristics that that qualify a theory and or a science as quote unquote fringe? Good. Yeah. Um, so I talked about the sort of sociological measure that you can use. Um, so just general absence in academic. Uh, forums for discourse. Um, and uh, I think it's important to recognize too that a theory can be fringe relative to like one discipline, but not to another discipline mm. or more fringe relative to one discipline than another. What's an, um, what's an example of that? Can you think of I guess I, I'm thinking of uh, continental drift, which was uh, not fringe to um, people studying like fossil records and um, like paleontology, uh, but was very fringe to uh, geologists. Uh, who were just very certain that the continents could not do something like move. Mm. Um, so, I mean, you can be absent from geology journals without being absent from paleontology journals. Okay. Right. Um, but I mean, in general, like a continental drift during its period on the fringe was uh, like completely absent from um, nature, for example, like not a single, not even like criticisms. Like, okay. so there's not even, you don't even get, like, it's just like so obviously wrong that <laughs> it's not worth yeah, bringing up. That it's not even worth bringing up in this context. And, it, you know, you, you get a lot of like ridicule and things like that. Um, I think like what makes a theory like super fringe is when it's like taboo to academics, you know, and this sort of can be captured with the sociological thing. Um, but then there's also like epistemic. Uh, features. Um, so one big thing is that fringe theories um, foreground anomalies. So they they basically look at what's anomalous to say the going theory, what theories um, or whatever. The, I mean, there's consensus views and then there's mainstream views, which some of which are consensus views, right? But so um, they look for you know what's what is the mainstream theory not capturing? I mean, some in some cases, um, the anomalies kind of just like go beyond mainstream theory, like you get um, UFOs. But uh, the idea is um, that with anomalies, you have to either you can either like dismiss them, sort of brush them under the rug, or say we'll deal with this later, or some other field should deal with this. Uh, but with fringe theories, you get them positively appraising them. So saying this is a real problem. Um, and the upshot of that is having to like reinterpret uh, the data surrounding the anomaly. And that leads to like a theory revision or theory change. But is, is it the case that an anomaly will encourage someone to develop a fringe theory? Or is, is it the case that someone has their own theory and then the, the anomaly according to some other uh, theory frame, theoretical framework, pops out at them. I would imagine one could um, kind of look at a theory and l- say, I'm going to find some anomalies, and then that'll help generate an diff- alternative theory. Yeah, I think that I think that's definitely possible. Um, I mean, I, I guess you don't, this may, might not be a necessary feature, and also uh, certainly not sufficient. Uh, mainstream theories, too, can uh, be really uh, taking anomalies seriously. Um, but it is very, a uh, very common feature. Um, so yeah, I mean, I could see somebody, uh, reinterpreting all the same data that a mainstream theory interprets, right. But without focusing on any particular anomaly. So in your, so I read your dissertation and I've seen a couple talks that you've given, uh, and um, I hadn't re- realized, so I, I saw your talk, and you talk about the Garcia effect. Since this is a neuroscience kind of artificial intelligence, more neuroscience podcast, uh, the Garcia effect like stood out to me as one of the major cases that you cite as having, uh, as having been a fringe theory that then became mainstream, and you kind of document the, the relative hell 
uh, that had to that Garcia had to go through in you know. Well, may, I'll just let, ask you to um, maybe tell that story uh, to people yeah. so, uh, as a concrete example. Yeah, cool. So, um, yeah, well, Garcia, uh, just, I mean, he was working at uh, the Naval Radiological Defense Lab uh, in uh, California, and he was studying the effects of radiation on the rat brain. And uh, in doing that, he just he sort of realized that the rats in the radiation chambers uh, started to avoid their water. Um, and he hypothesized that uh, that had to do with them associating the taste of the water with the radiation. Hmm. Um, and so, I mean, the going theory at this time was like behaviorist ideas like Skinner and uh, so on, um, which, you know, thought that behaviors could be uh, conditioned, right? but in order to condition a behavior, in order to learn a new behavior, the uh, two associated events have to be like contiguous in time and place. So one after another and repeated. Hmm. Um, and another uh, tenet here was that uh, all stimuli have equal potential to become conditioned. And in the behaviorism playbook. That yes. Intended. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, Garcia did this uh, study with... Um, he did, he did a couple studies in the 50s, 1950, 1957, um, showing that uh, you could condition with a long delay, so you didn't need the two events to be contiguous, so uh, radiation um, and uh, the sweet, they, they used like saccharin, um, so sweet water. Mm -hmm. uh, the rats started avoiding the sweet water in their radiation chambers. What? Um, sorry, what was Garcia's first name? John. John Garcia. John Garcia. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where was I? Um, uh, he had the he had been well. The the, you originally described his experiments, so he um, hypothesized that the rats were associating the taste of the um, water with uh, mm -hmm. their radiological right. sickness. Right. Yeah. So he tested this. And the, the, right. I, the thing is, I don't know if you mentioned this, that if, when you radiate, right, a, a mouse, um, it takes a long time or it takes, there's a long delay before it feels any of the illness effects. Right. Right. Yeah. Which totally. So, I mean, there were questions too about like, what's the, um, like whether you should consider the radiation itself or the illness. And I think eventually it was the illness mm. um, that was coming to the picture. Um, but... The stimulus, right, was the radiation. Um, so uh, the idea is, was that rats were associating the effects of the radiation, right, what they were experiencing as the radiation with uh, the flavor of the water. Hmm. And this did not fit the stimulus response, need to be paired um, congruently in time very quickly and repeatedly. Yeah, and also paired. it was like a one-shot learning. You know, you don't need it to be repeated. It just... That's it. Yeah. They just don't drink that water. But the, the first few publications, so at first, uh, John Garcia did not, I'm telling a little bit of your story and, and just interrupt yeah. me because uh, no, the, the first few publications that he that he submitted were essentially accepted. And you argue that that's partly because he interpreted his results by saying that it actually was not incongruent with behav behaviorism. So in, he kind of like couched the experiments or tried to make the results of the experiments fit the behavioralist paradigm. But then yeah. he started getting into trouble when he um, started using language that uh, questioned the behaviorist paradigm. Yes, totally. So, I mean, originally tried to fit it into the sort of classical conditioning uh, language, right? And, um, you know, uh, it didn't really generate uh, any citations. Like nobody was paying, just nobody really cared. Um, which is also interesting. Um, and I mean, it got into science, you know, so that's a big deal, um, or, sh you know, should be right. But then 
later, like, to, you know, like, I mean, he was continuing to do studies and, you know, he's publishing on all different kinds of things. He was working on his PhD um, eventually and uh, eventually finished it. And um, after leaving for, uh, for a while, after failing a statistics exam. Um, and it gives he, us all hope. It gives us all yeah. hope. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Sort of. uh, <laughs> because, but then he was shunned. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, first you're shunned, right? And then, then there's hope. Um, so he, around uh, what is it, 1966, he uh, published a couple more papers, uh, which um, really called into question the some of the behaviorist principles. Um, those three that I mentioned, the uh, stimulus, equipotentiality, um, the repetition and the contiguity in space and time. Uh, and people were not pleased with this. Um, I mean, they did, so those papers did not get into uh, science. Uh, he had tried. Um, they also were rejected from um, the Journal for Comparative Physiology and Psychology, um, which is like a APA journal. Hmm. Um, and ended up in a uh, was sort of new journal at the time, um, Psychonomic Science, mm -hmm. which was more about uh, measurement than about um, learning, right? and um, didn't have like a whole peer review process. Like, and he ended up publishing like a shorter version of both of those papers in Psychonomic Science because neither of them could get published elsewhere. Um, and yeah, and then you know the the whole story goes on um, for about some. 10, 15 years. I mean, he won the uh, APA's Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award um, in 1980, 1979, you know, some 15 years or so. And even during that time, even when he was winning the APA's award, he was still getting uh, journal rejections uh, from APA, mm. uh, APA journals. <laughs> um, so, and I mean, not everybody, um, not everyone bought it, uh, like, I think. Um, you probably remember me talking about this guy, uh, Bitterman, mm. um, who was uh, just very resistant to these ideas. And then there's like the famous line of like, oh, you're, you know, those findings from Garcia are no more, no more likely than bird shit in a cuckoo clock. Yeah. Which he, did he quote that in his um, sort of, a, he had an acceptance speech slash letter, right? I'm not, did he yeah. quote it in that? As, no, he was he, it's not about, from him. Oh, uh, Okay. No, no, yeah, but I thought and, he quoted as someone yeah. having criticized him. Uh, yeah, so he goes through all the yeah all the <laughs> sort of rejections he got. Yeah, um, he kept tra he kept tabs. <laughs> yeah, totally, and um, yeah, so he, I mean, he, uh, I think, in a sort of joking way, like he's clearly a little bit uh, was a little bitter about it. Um, he uh, diagnoses the rejections he got as like neophobia mm -hmm. of uh, editorial consultants. And um, I think the funny thing about that is, is that his theories, um, his idea that this was conditioned learning that was happening here um, were rejected as like, oh, no, it's just neophobia. Like the rats are just afraid of this new, I don't know water in this new situation or something. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there are different interpretations, right? But ultimately, right, his case um, wins out. So, And now the effect has his namesake, the Garcia effect. Yeah, right. the Garcia effect, yeah. And, and so in like, sort of the upshot is that there was this uh, scientific effect. I don't know, was it already, was it theory already? Or it kind of just started with an observation. And did he develop yeah. a theory then to counter the behaviorist paradigm? Or was it more like, this is an anomaly, guys. Everybody, everybody yeah. Guys and gals. So, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, that's definitely something that I thought I thought a bit about, which is that it's not what he's proposing is not really a theory. Um, it's more of a constraint to behaviorist theory, or like the imperialism of uh, behaviorism, mm -hmm. right? So showing that we don't, you know, it's not only in cases where there's repetition that learning happens and it's not only in cases uh and also to the um stimulus uh equipotentiality thing where um actually it does matter what the stimulus is um yeah and it matters how you're t which senses you're taking it in 
right? Yep, yep. So, um, and there were other people at the time who were working on working on um, animal behavior and finding that it was impossible to condition certain types of behaviors. Um, so, I think one of the examples uh, I gave was that. Uh, uh, the Brellins, uh, who had this animal behavior em- enterprises, were um, like trying to condition behaviors in um, like raccoons and I mean all kinds of animals, um, and they were trying to get a raccoon to uh, put a coin in a piggy bank. Of course, <laughs> of course, right? Because yeah, um, <laughs> and uh, he instead uh, would just like rub the coin in this like very miserly fashion, I guess in a way that's similar to the way they like rub their food. Like he wouldn't let go of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But anyway, so I mean, the point is that um, there were other people like in the background kind of contributing to this idea that we could have, and like the stimulus, the stimulus matters, Mm -hmm. um, right? Not any animal is just going to do anything um, through conditioning. But are are you saying that that is one of the drivers of, of the Garcia effect becoming more mainstream or being accepted? Um, I think so. Okay. I think because that contributed. There is also, um, if I remember correctly, there was also the the quote-unquote cognitive revolution that was happening at the same kind of time, and behaviorism was being, uh, I'm not going to say, I won't say attacked, but over, overthrown by the cognitive revolution, right? And so yeah. that sort of made it more acceptable that these kinds of experiment or results would be... Um, interpreted in a more favorable fashion, perhaps. Yeah, totally. So, um, I mean, well, some people uh, would deny this. So um, I I talked to some different uh, scientists who were involved in the um, working on the like early replications of the Garcia effect. uh, And some of them say it had nothing to do with the cognitive revolution. Um, Others say, no, it totally did. Like all about it. Shocking. Um, People have different opinions. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But yeah, my take is that um, so a couple people who were really crucial for helping the Garcia effect gain um, respectability um, include like Martin Seligman and uh, Paul Rosen. And I mean, Seligman had this book um, where Garcia, there were articles, like five different papers from Garcia published in it. But at the same time, too, he was coming up with this sort of like computational language for describing cognition Hmm. um, and like as having like there being these internal states, um, which was, uh, you know, not the behaviorist's cup of tea. Um, So, and I mean, especially when it comes to animals, I think that Hmm. was a problem. So, I mean, the reason people think, oh, it had nothing to do with the cognitive revolution is because the cognitive revolution was so focused on humans. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. But I definitely think there's some coincidence there. So, but so, give like what are a few of your other go-to examples? And you know, you don't have to tell like the full stories, but just to kind of rip off some some theories that began as fringe and are now accepted as mainstream to to let people you know realize that there's more than just a few of these because they're really kind of endless. Yeah. Um, so we've uh, got magnetoreception in birds that was. Uh, proposed in like 1870s, something like that. Uh, And I mean, the the sort of anomaly there was that uh, they noticed that young birds uh, were migrating without the help of adults. So the question was like, how are they doing this? Um, So there were some theories that said like uh, the stars were orienting the birds. Anyway, I won't get too much into the details unless you, you want to ask no, more. No. But, um, yeah, yeah, rip off a few. Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, so, yeah, so magnetoreception in birds, that became mainstream maybe uh, 1950s, 60s, okay. 70s, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, now in humans, that's uh, there's some research there in the mainstream happening. Oh, uh, is it? In the, oh, my my understanding of that was that it's still fringe. My reading it's of definitely your... still fringe. Yeah, definitely okay. still fringe. Um, but people, I mean, there's a guy at Stanford who's working on it, um, and has shown that you know they they the human brain responds to uh, changing magnetic fields. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, so it's still fringe. Um, 
Others, other examples of theories that were once fringe. Um, continental drift is like the big one. Yeah, yeah, you had mentioned that one before. Um, are there any of them that are like more amusing to you that that um, you know that you think of as kind of you know like you? Well, I guess continental drift and I, I guess the three you've already listed uh, would be the most amusing to you because you use them extensively. Yeah, well, uh, so there's a bunch of other ones. Um, I mean, there are dozens. Um, so. Uh, there's a few examples from traditional ecological knowledge of uh, theories that were just thought to be, you know, sort of like spiritual mythology uh, that later uh, turned out to be true. Um, so uh, one example is um, olfaction in whales. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The Ask the uh, Inuits. Eskimos at the time? Inuits? Yeah. I'm not sure what mm -hmm. we're supposed to call them. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah Arctic and subarctic Inuit peoples. Um, found that they had to put out their fires on land in order to hunt for um, the whales. And I mean, the reason uh, people thought this uh, couldn't be is that uh, toothed whales don't have an olfactory system. Um, but it turns out that like baleen bullhead whales uh, have quite the olfactory system. Okay. Um, and yeah, so that, I mean, that theory was around for, I mean, probably thousands of years, uh, and um, but I mean, dismissed probably for less a shorter period than that. Um, but ultimately, uh, one out. There's also firebirds, um, which uh, what drop. What, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I thought you were yeah, going to talk about them without explaining what they are because I know yeah, them as a car, birds. for instance. <laughs> yeah, so um, firebirds are uh, falcons or uh, kites who. Drop their drop burning sticks on unburned areas of forest, um, and you know this is thought to be like I mean this is part of like a creation kind of story, hmm. um, but of course um, you know people in the mainstream are like uh, that's crazy why would any why would a bird do that um, and uh, I mean really recently like I think it's twenty seventeen. Oh. Um, they found that, uh, yes, there are uh, birds that drop burning sticks on unburned areas of forest. And the idea is to uh, get all the insects and little rodents and stuff out of the forest so that they're easier to catch. Yeah. 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 It's a good idea. <laughs> it's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you like to eat that sort of thing. So <laughs> one of the reasons why you know I, I wanted to have you on after learning more about your work is – because neuroscience, and I'll just say that let's say the studies of intelligence, right? Artificial intelligence, natural intelligence is still a very new field. And as you, I'm sure, are aware, there are about 6,000 different theories about consciousness, for example. And recently, uh, you know, I've, I've had on uh, multiple people who are questioning the I guess, mainstream or consensus story uh, in neuroscience about memory and how memories are stored, uh, whether it's like through the synapses between neurons or if it's somehow stored intracellularly. And, you know, so I started wondering, well, is this fringe? Is the intracellular memory story fringe? Because one of the uh, guests, you know, is having trouble getting funding, mm. um, which is a gate, That's definitely, gatekeeping. Yeah, that's definitely Well, it's a, a sign, yeah, right? It's a, it's a sign. sign that it's fringe. Totally. Um, but but and and we didn't talk about this. So I, I want to come back to consciousness in a minute because I'm sure you have thoughts on on uh, like recent goings on about pseudoscience, etc. Um, but but backing up again, just to one of the general features of that makes something labeled as fringe is that there's an active suppression, right, of of the ideas in the community, whether it's from editors. Um, and and so this funding issue, right, that uh, the funding is not provided to this particular person or persons who have these ideas that are not mainstream is kind of an active um, suppression, silencing. Yeah. Marginalization yeah. is Those the term that you yeah. use as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if you want to just speak to that. I, I just wanted to throw that in there. I'm not sure if we mentioned it before. Um, but, but yeah, that's so I've been having these people on the podcast, these researchers, and of course I've always been interested in consciousness as all, uh, interesting humans are, yeah. um, I'm not saying that I'm interesting, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, do you, 
Do you have the lay of the land of, of consciousness theories and what, what is considered fringe, what is considered mainstream? Because there was a recent kerfuffle about one group of people calling another group, not calling them pseudoscience or calling their ideas pseudoscience. I think in that paper, they actually alluded to the idea that integrated information theory has been labeled by someone as potentially pseudoscience. And this caused everyone to, to say that the authors of the paper were actually calling IIT pseudoscience. Uh, pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you must have enjoyed uh, following this. If you, if you so I didn't it. follow it too closely. Mostly uh, what I know about it is hearsay. Uh, but I, I okay. am up on theories best, of consciousness. Kind of uh, <laughs> uh, I okay. used to, yeah, I, that used to be by my whole game uh, was consciousness, consciousness studies. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, at least in philosophy, um, like panpsychism, for example, is pretty mainstream, I would say. It's becoming more mainstream, but there's a lot of, I, I think that there are, are passions that become apparent when talking about something like panpsychism, right? Um, passions? Yeah, people, people's intuitions take over. People, um, you know, like the discarding of an idea mm -hmm. as being ridiculous on the surface, yeah, totally. for example, that the rock is conscious. Yeah. Oh, um, totally. I mean, at least when it's put that way. I mean, so I guess um, there's panpsychist views that are, I guess, less wild. Uh, like they don't say mm -hmm. rocks are conscious, um, right? They're more like um, there's something going on at the level, at the like lowest level of uh, physics that is generating consciousness at like mm -hmm. the human level. Um, so, I mean, whether that's really panpsychism is, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. So panpsychism as like rocks are conscious is definitely fringe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're not supposed to be laughing at this, right? Because, uh, we're, but no, that's exactly, that's exactly the right. problem. You're, because your solution is. It, we're part of the problem. Yeah. I'm part of the problem. I know that. Uh, <laughs> but it's entertaining. The, the problems that are, are entertaining, but, but. Your solution is sort of an extreme pluralism, and maybe we'll come come to that. Um, but so so we'll pause here because uh, let's say the word pan panpsychism. Well, there are four hundred different flavors of panpsychism, and the term panpsychism. I'm not sure about its etymology and its history, but presumably it meant one thing at one time, and it's the the, the features, the way that we define panpsychism or any term drifts over time. And I'm wondering uh -huh. how much of the of considering something that used to be fringe and now is mainstream, how much of it or how often can it be the case that what's actually happening is that we're just reinterpreting a term that used to be w used one way and now we're interpreting it a different way, but we use the same word for it. And oh. if that's a fair way to look at it. Totally. I mean, totally. So I think actually, again, continental drift is a good case to look at here because um, Alfred Wagner, who is uh, probably the most famous for proposing continental displacement, uh, had this uh, sort of astronomical mechanism for it, which, uh, yeah, was not something that was accepted by, ever accepted by uh, mainstream geology. Um and so, I mean, it did, it did change significantly from the time uh, Alfred Wagner proposed it to the time it was accepted some half a century later. Hmm. Um, what didn't change is that the continents move. <laughs> okay. Right. right. And um, I think that's what's important. I think, and I think you'll see this in a lot of cases of fringe theories where it's like they're not necessarily like mature theories in the sense of like have it all worked out, right? So a lot of them are lacking a mechanism to explain how they work. So they'll often invoke like sort of what seems like magical ideas to uh, explain something where you see this in like parapsychology. Um, and I think like seeing that as a problem is uh, a problem. So uh, rather than recognizing that that's a feature of theories that are uh, just, you know, coming to the coming into the mm -hmm. game. And um, so, yeah, so I mean, not everything will stay the same about a theory when it moves from fringe to mainstream. 
right? Um, certainly a lot of the original features are lost, but I, I think the, the, what's relevant here is that like the core idea, like in continental drift, the idea that the continents can change their positions and break apart over time, right, is that's still true. Has the term continent been consistent over time? What we mean by when we say continent, I mean, you know, there are just these issues like, so when people debate the word intelligence, for example, or consciousness, mm -hmm. um, I, I would say, I would guess 90% of the time they're talking past each other because they're just, they have different conceptual frameworks regarding the terms that they're using right. and the way that they approach it. And I, you write about theory ladenness and a bunch of that stuff in, in the, and so we don't have to get deep in the commensurability, et cetera. Um, but, but I just wonder, you know, how much, so when a fringe theory becomes mainstream, you're saying that the cluster of features of <clears throat> the theory can change as it cha as it becomes mainstream. So it's not like it just, here's a theory, people thought, it was bad. Now it's become mainstream and people think it's good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, even if you think about these cases that I brought up from traditional ecological knowledge, right, you don't get the whole um, spiritual mythology story along with firebirds. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean, so, but I think the core of the theory is what is becoming mainstream in these cases. So I mentioned, um, Pseudoscience, the term pseudoscience, uh, and I mentioned it in uh, in talking about this recent uh, paper that was signed like by a bunch of consciousness researchers, uh, and the label was applied to integrated information theory, which is a burgeoning and mainstream, I would say, uh, approach to consciousness uh, these days. But the term pseudoscience is a real insult. Um, these days. And uh, so what, what makes something count as pseudoscience? Uh, great question. So uh, the way I understand pseudoscience is um, someone is doing pseudoscience if they're pretending to do science, but don't really believe they are. Right. So uh, rarely are you going to get somebody who is being dismissed as a pseudoscientist, uh, hmm. accepting that title, <laughs> right? Um, most people who are doing pseudoscience uh, believe they're doing science. Mm. Uh, they don't believe they're faking it, right? Um, so, I mean, I, I see pseudoscience really as just a term of abuse and almost vulgar, um, should be a curse word. Um, but I mean, in the sense of like, oh, you're just like mm. faking it, right? Um, but I really what we, the, what the way it functions is just to silence, um, I mean, at least uh, the sort of consensus in philosophy is that there's not really much meaning to the term. Oh, because um, it's like the worst kind of burn you can give to a scientist. Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And it, yeah, I mean, as soon as the theory is dismissed as pseudoscience, it has uh, there are negative consequences for that theory. Yeah. Um, so I think that's probably part of what underlies that whole uh, uh, debate about uh, inf integrated information theory. Um, that whole thing was like kind of over overplayed, overdone, but that's what social media also does these days. And let's not talk about social media. Uh, but <laughs> Okay, so we have, uh, let's say we have a fringe theory. What, what I want to know is, you know, how does a fringe theory become mainstream, right? Because I, you it, it's kind of like the fringe theory is the underdog and you're kind of rooting for the underdog if it has the potential to become, mm -hmm. quote unquote, mainstream, because mainstream means you've somehow succeeded uh, in, in promoting your theory from fringe to mainstream. So like what other qualities of fringe theories? Is there a way to tell what a promising fringe theory is that it's, you know, has the promise to become mainstream? Are there features that you can point to, for, for example? Uh, so, I mean, I know like I, all of my cases are like of fringe theory is becoming mainstream, and this is supposed to convince people that uh, mainstream status means that a theory is true. But uh, just uh, equally, uh, mainstream theories do not stay mainstream, right? So mm -hmm. measuring a theory's success in terms of its uh, mainstream status seems uh, like a bit of a 
problem. Um, but that is the way, I mean, that is, that is what convinces people, right? Is that, you know, scientists have taken it up, so it must be legitimate. So, but you don't have like uh so I kind of read into your work that you're kind of rooting for the fringe theories to have an equal footing at the table. Mm -hmm. Um, so that they're not then kind of dissolving the term fringe, right? So that everything is kind of mainstream, but to put it on, but that's assuming that mainstream is good, right? So let, so let's say a, a theory goes from fringe to mainstream and now what happens to it? You know, now that it's mainstream, now you have other fringes competing with, with it as the mainstream winner, right? Totally. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's definitely true. Um, so what I think, um, I mean, some promising, like something that might indicate that a theory is, has potential to become mainstream is just it's, uh, people, um, resisting it, like paying attention to it in any way. Um, right. So people putting energy into debunking a theory, um, is indicative that that theory somehow threatens, um, the mainstream theory. Um, Right, enough to actually say something about it. Um, as opposed to, let's say, because I was going to ask, so as a scientist, I'm kind of indifferent to some theories, right? So I don't need to actively mm -hmm. suppress anything. I'm just, I just, it's not in my worldview and it doesn't affect me and I don't care. Is that uh, super fringe for me? Is indifference worse than debunk, trying to debunk? Whereas, yeah. Um, no, I, I think indifference is totally uh, you know, normal. And, um, like what super fringe is when, uh, it's like, we can't talk about it because it's so, uh, oh, taboo. taboo. Yeah. It's, or like, mm -hmm. at least if we talk about it, we're going to be like telling a joke. Right. Um, like, oh, aliens. Yeah. yeah. It's the best kind of fringe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. It's fun. Um, but yeah, maybe we shouldn't be having so much fun um, with some of these theories. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's science is yeah. supposed to be fun. So yeah, we should be having fun, but right. not in a derogatory yeah. Yeah. Uh, way, perhaps. Um, yeah. yeah, I didn't think about this as like now people are going to lose their like joke database. <laughs> but, oh yeah, and that's that's kind of precious actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, so um, uh, you know, in, in you write about. Thomas Kuhn and Karl Popper about how science, you know, goes and sort of the Kuhnian scientific progress, the Popperian scientific progress. And Kuhn writes about, you know, scientific norms and how they kind of eventually get overthrown over the course of a, quote, scientific revolution. Is that mm -hmm. one of the characteristics of fringe theories is that they're sort of pre, uh, uh, what is the word that Kuhn uses? Pre- Paradigmatic. Uh, pre, yeah, pre-paradigm. Um, yeah, so I mean, great question. And totally that is uh, something that we see with fringe theories uh, is that they sort of defy the uh, methodological and procedural norms that uh, we tend to value in science. So things like um, internal consistency hmm. of a theory, hmm. um, but also consistency with established theories. Um, so right with like, uh, ufology, right. You get theories there that, uh, ufology, the study of UFOs, I should just clarify. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that, uh, you know, sort of defy the laws of physics, uh, which, you know, that's, uh, not being consistent with established theories. Right. Um, other things like include like lacking a mechanism, which I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, if you don't propose a mechanism, like if your theory does not propose a mechanistic account? Uh, if there isn't an acceptable mechanism, a mechanism that people will... If it's magic. You know, buy. Like, if it's magic, that doesn't work. Right. right? Um, so, yeah. And of course, like when theory is taken up by the mainstream, like a lot of those things, those things go away. Um, but... Uh, I think just looking at those features, um, just breaking the norms as like a bad thing is um, just sort of short sighted, I guess it, you know, like we're, we shouldn't expect uh, theories on the fringe to be following norms. We shouldn't expect the same norms for theory construction as we expect for uh, theory mm -hmm. testing. Um, so, 
the idea with, as I see it, at least with fringe theories, is we're uh, discovering hypotheses to be tested, not uh, testing hypotheses. So lacking evidence and cherry picking and things like that uh, shouldn't really be norms that come into the picture. Mm. Let, let's transition and talk and talk about your solution, your proposed solution, mm. which you don't call extreme pluralism. You just use the term pluralism, but it is maybe extreme is the it's a hef is a maybe extreme is too extreme a term. It is a hefty pluralism. A uh, a uh, what kind of pluralism? What adjective would you put in front front of pluralism to describe your blur, your brand of pluralism that is aimed at solving? Um, the way that we treat fringe theories, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, extreme, extreme works. I would say thoroughgoing. Thoroughgoing. Okay. Yeah. Aspirational. Um, That's that has a nice <laughs> ring to it. It sounds kind. Aspirational. <laughs> that can be that can be your adjective. Um, <laughs> extreme uh, is fine. Yeah. Ex yeah. Extreme. Extreme pluralism. Um, I didn't know it was so extreme. Um, so, I mean, it's really. I guess it's extreme in the sense of uh, I'm. Uh, Everyone is included. Yeah, yeah. Describe describe what you think should should happen. So pluralism is, uh, well, I'm a I'm a pluralist about theories, right? Okay. So specifically, uh, this idea that we should be using more than one theory to uh, investigate some domain, um, and those theories need not be mutually consistent. Just differentiate theory and framework for me. And yeah, because a framework, I think that a framework comes along with the ride, comes along for the ride with a theory, right? Yeah. So, a th I mean, another, I guess, theoretical framework is maybe a, okay. uh, the same as theory. I mean, maybe you get with framework. Okay. Theories can be uh, more general or more precise. Like th there are many theories that make up a single theory, you might say. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, with theory two, you get like what methods are okay. Like that's, that can be part of theory. So you might, might think of this more as like uh, paradigm pluralism. Okay. Um, so being able to use like alternative research methods, right. Um, alongside uh, the established research methods. Yeah. So, right. You can with pluralism. What you, what the ideal is, is to uh, be able to sort of switch between uh, between the theories you're using. So, investigate the same domain with two different theories. So, theories that are not necessarily consistent with one another. Um, and it's sort of like the gestalt switching that happens with the like the Necker cube, like seeing it this way and then seeing it that way. Right. But it's the same so, thing you're seeing. As an individual researcher, you're saying you should be able to hold that, uh, those, what is that, cognitive dissonance holding to... Uh, yeah, which is hard. Yeah, which is hard. But if if your version of pluralism is the way to go, I don't have to hold two theories in mind. I have to hold 600 theories in mind, right? Yeah, well, and thousands. I have, I have my, <laughs> okay, thousands about my particular... Yeah, but no, Necker so team. I mean... Uh, part of what I say about this is that uh, not everybody has to use every theory, right? Um, I mean, uh, the main thing is to be uh, more tolerant towards uh, alternative theories. But I think people shouldn't do research according to a theory that they are not interested in in any way. Oh, um, I was going to ask you that because we, we all have our individual yeah, interests as well. totally, yeah. Just as you wouldn't do research on a topic that you're not interested in, you shouldn't use a theory that you're not. But if I want to claim progress on the topic that I'm interested in, what you're saying is that I damn well better know all of the different viewpoints, or it would behoove me to know all of the different viewpoints yes. if I want to claim progress. I don't know what you mean by progress, but... Um... Well, I was going to ask you what progress is, so I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> because I, because as a, as, I, I think a lot of people are like me in research at least, in that I've, you know, often questioned, like, what I'm doing can be fun, um, it can be answering scientific questions, certain ones, but is it really progress? Am I making any progress? So, and and I don't know that I have a good answer to that. I mean, it's, the, the, 
basic research game is a long game, right? And you can't really predict what kind of quote unquote progress or discoveries are going to come from it. So you're often like swimming in this, you know, deep ocean, not knowing whether you're actually heading towards shore for a terrible yeah. analogy. Sorry. So, do you, so what is what is progress, right? If 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 we need to bring fringe to the mainstream or treat them treat everything with tolerance, presumably that's because you think that uh, different um, perspective, different theory, theoretical frameworks um, have the ability to generate "quote unquote" progress equally. Okay, so progress. Just uh, stepping back to that is, I mean, the way I see it, at least, it requires uh, to understand whether we are making progress, we have to have some goalpost in mind. Yeah. Um, and that is not something that like is given to us by nature. Like we, we stipulate it. that. Yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, depending on what our goals are, right. It's, uh, are we making progress or not making progress? Um, but with theories contributing um, in a sort of pluralistic way, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that like each one is making progress so much as like um, putting them all together uh, would allow you to see things in a more nuanced way. Uh, whereas working with a single theory uh, sort of shuts off certain possibilities uh, from your mind and um, so I don't know, like progress, uh, if progress is the right word here for... Well, yeah, we. I mean, we don't have to quibble, quibble about the word progress, mm -hmm. but I mean, you brought up... Const so go ahead. I'm sorry. I, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. um, so you brought up... I think you just brought up constraint, or maybe I, maybe it popped into my head because I've been thinking about constraints as a very positive thing mm -hmm. uh, in the past couple years. Uh, and in, in a sense, you you know, to make any... <laughs> movement to have a thought you have a, you have to have a constraint because it, and it, if you don't have any mm. constraints everything dissolves into a uniform distribution which means that there's nothing because there's everything and nothing can move right and and so you have to have some sort of constraints uh, on your theories as well you have to have a viewpoint or i mean you can have multiple viewpoints right but within that one viewpoint constraint is necessary correct um, within a single viewpoint, constraint is necessary. To make a claim, you have to have background assumptions. You have to say, like, certain things can't happen. Sure. Is yeah. that what you mean? Yeah, it could be. Um, but mm, what's a different way to put this? Let's go with that. Let's go. With that. Well, I mean, I guess with, like, testing a hypothesis, right, you don't test it unless it could turn out to fail, right? <clears throat> right. Okay. Well, maybe I'll bring this in because I was going to ask you about this anyway, and maybe this can serve as the as the background okay. example. Um, since you have a, a background in studying consciousness uh, research or studies or theories, and that used to be your entire thing, you said, um, you, you're probably well aware of the modern dominance of the computational or the, the brain as a computer metaphor, the computational approach to studying mm -hmm. brains and mind, right? Um, in the neurosciences and the cognitive sciences. Um, and there are alternative metaphors, you know, that uh, people have proposed that I suppose you would call mm. fringe. But when you take the, so you, if you take the computational approach, you're assuming that, that the brain is some sort, is computing something, right? And then you can say, well, what, what is it computing? And then you can use the mathematical functions that we uh, have used to make predictions about brain activity. And that's been very, very successful. Uh -huh. And it wouldn't have been able to occur uh, without the background metaphor that the, the brain is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So I'm not sure if that's um, an example for, you know, as, a, as uh, a theory needing to have constraints in order to make progress. Right. Okay, I see what you're saying. So, um, I mean, yeah, so what you want is uh, you don't want to be using all the theories like as continuous, which would be like really hard to do when you have like mutually inconsistent theories, um, mm -hmm. right? You want each theory to like give you some kind of constraint, like a way to see uh, the events unfolding um, according to a different view, right? So like according to the computational view, I mean, what would be another 
what would be the alternative to the computational view? Uh, that, that the brain is a dissipative structure, um, that uh, the brain is a cascading uh, phenomenon. Yeah, so uh, totally. Yeah, so I mean, and this, that actually uh, brings up like one of the sort of things I've been thinking about with theories um, is that they're sort of like metaphors or analogies. Like they're, they don't tell you like the way the world is. They give you a way of mm -hmm. looking at the world. Um, so like as a cascade or as a computer or, um, or whatever. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think the more of these we can like use and like compare them, you know, compare them to each other. Like we get a more, uh, we capture more of the subtleties, um, that are going on in nature. Do we capture them or do we appreciate them more? Mm, yeah, I'm, capture might be the wrong word there. Well, yeah, I mean, this brings up my own epistemic and resource limitations, right? Because, the, you know, alternative frameworks are attractive to me because I appreciate how, um, like, the per perspectivalism, right, is a different way to, of, of stating this. Hmm. Like, I appreciate the different w viewpoints it gives me into a phenomenon, uh, but... I often wonder, like, how much purchase, first of all, how much time do I spend on thinking about this because I have a day job? Secondly, mm. how much purchase does it actually give me to dive in? You know, how how deep do I need to dive in? Uh, and because there's a, a danger that it, I will gain nothing <laughs> from it, right? And you don't want to go down empty, uh, dead-end roads a, a lot. Yeah. I mean, with any research, right, there's a danger that you get nothing nothing from it um right but but, but if you might think but if, this is sorry to interrupt but if you're working in the mainstream right uh mm -hmm. your your peers are, are going to believe whether you got something or not are believe going to believe that you're doing it the right way <laughs> yeah way. at least that <laughs> right yeah let me ask you this okay so I, I guess what i'm getting at like is your long-term vision for this because you, you want to be able to mm -hmm. catalog all of the different available mm -hmm. theories just because as it is right now, if you open nature or something like that, you're not going to be able to access yeah. them. Uh, but you, you want like some sort of resource ultimately that is like the encyclopedia of theories oh, totally. about subject X, exactly. right? Exactly, yes. Uh, is that your long-term goal? Uh, that, I mean, that's a great way to put it. And um, it's, encyclopedia is the way I've thought about thought about this a bit. Um, it's oh, sort of like okay. creating a a system, like a socially mediated system. That uh, where people uh, contribute like their observations and theories they use or their interpretations of those observations, um, and those all get like piled into like that just becomes like what science is, and you get like you know people you get like status about like what people's backgrounds are like this is an MD or like this is a neuroscientist right um, and uh, you can like generate out of that like what you could even like figure out like what the consensus view is or like um, you could have even have like upvotes, uh, upvote system involved. Um, but then there's also other options too, which are like, um, like nature could uh, have an issue every year where they uh, highlight fringe theories. Mm -hmm. I think people would be really interested in that. Um, right? It might increase their readership. Um, sure. Like but... reality television shows increase. <laughs> viewership right no but i'm serious it's like i'm not calling fringe theories a train wreck but everyone likes to see a train wreck and if if it's something outside of like your everyday experience and world i mean some people might tune in for the comedic value or for the like oh let me see about all these people that are doing science that is um invalid or pseudoscience or ridiculous and it makes me feel better to see uh you know all of this terrible science going on right so there, there's entertainment value in it, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that that could be. But I think uh, part of what it would do is, like, show people that uh, actually these people are uh, mm -hmm. doing science pretty well uh, in some cases. And, um, you know, especially like, I'm sure, like, the if nature did choose to have a fringe issue, um, they would be highlighting cases where people were doing um, really interesting right. stuff. Um and not just like have it be like a comedy yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I um, wasn't seriously suggesting that it you know should 
just have comedic <laughs> value. But I, but I'm, I'm just agreeing with you that it would be popular. Uh, but for some more cynical reasons, I think. Yeah. Okay. I mean, fair enough. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think people will like laugh things off before they actually read into it. And I mean, a lot of, actually a part of where my interest in fringe theories came from is I just couldn't stop mm. reading or listening to these, I, these bizarre ideas. And, uh, yeah, at some point you like listen so much that you're like, wait, this isn't as like bizarre as I thought it was, or there's more to mm. this than people think. Um, and often we just like, the reason we laugh at aliens and UFOs is because, uh, that's all we think. Like, we just think, oh, like, you know, little green men and, I, 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 uh, no. there's way more to, there's way more to it yeah. than that. Uh, I don't laugh at aliens. I think that's, I think that's <laughs> a dangerous idea actually to laugh at aliens, but yeah, in a different, different way. I don't laugh at the people studying alien ufologists or, or anything that of that nature as well. Well, it's not been, anymore. Not, well, I never did, but um, oh, this is a w huge tangent that we can't go on, I suppose. But uh, I mean, you know, I had a huge prior that uh, that some sort of extraterrestrial beings had been here before. And so the, you know, the last couple of years with the, um, what are the UAPs now? I mean, it's not surprising, mm -hmm. It's but it's shocking that it's not bigger. It's it's world changing news and it's shocking that it's not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, there's like disclosure has happened and uh, nobody cares. <laughs> I mean, that's, I don't know. I mean, people are still like, uh, yeah, I don't, I still don't believe it. Yeah. Um, like, especially people who were like around when like, uh, you know, in the sixties when stuff was coming out about UFOs and then, turned out all to be like a hoax, right? It was mm -hmm. just like a weather balloon or something. Yeah. Right. Um, I think people who've like had that experience of like being hopeful and then like being disappointed uh, are more resistant now. Oh, you think so? Yeah. But would you call, okay, so would you call, um, what would we call it? The, the idea of extraterrestrial beings? What, what I want to do is give it a label. Is it fringe <laughs> still or is it mainstream? Like where would, you, where would it be in your continuum? Um, I mean, I could still think we could still call it theories in ufology. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there's problems with calling them aliens, right? Just like calling anybody an alien is... Oh, like it's uh, social... Offensive. Oh, it's offensive? Okay. Yeah. Or what's the... Yeah. Politically incorrect, perhaps. Is it derogatory? I don't know. I, don't know. I never... Derogatory. Know. Yeah. You can't use words but anymore. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah, you can't use words anymore. Right. Um, but, right. Um, so what's the question if aliens yeah is that is that is that fringe or mainstream or where is it on the on your continuum uh it's so i mean there are definitely theories in ufology that are still very fringe okay, um, so it's not one thing for example that the aliens are here um as like rebranding themselves as like mm -hmm. the angels and demons uh from the past uh they're rebranding themselves for like a scientific audience mm. um like that's a very fringe theory still um but then i think in general uh the whole idea that uh we're actually seeing something here like uh these are craft like these are not just weather balloons or clouds um is becoming mainstream mm. i would say it's in the transition phase um just considering how many people still just have no idea. Like it's not like the New York times isn't putting out articles about uh, these are real, right? It's still like people are really still hesitant about making any sort of claims in this vicinity. But I mean, literally it's like in Congress, right? Yeah. It's like people have made statements that, uh, yes, um, we, uh, recovered a crashed craft, uh, including uh, non-human biologics. And we're all like, all right, I got to go to work. See you later. Thanks <laughs> See you for letting later. me know. Right, yeah. Exactly. yeah, it's it's insane. Yeah. But we, I could talk about this all day, all day, but it's it's not the focus of my podcast. So yeah, okay, we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll continue the conversation afterward. But yeah. um, for the purpose of uh, the podcast, we should say that uh, – so what I, what I have called your extreme pluralism, 
there are cases in which you deny that a fringe theory should be taken seriously. I mean, you're not, well, I guess you wouldn't call it a fringe theory, but uh, you want to talk about a few of the reasons why we might not accept a theory um, as on equal footing? Why we shouldn't or why, why we, we sh don't? Why we, in cases why we should not, should not normatively. Um, I would say uh, if it's uh, fraudulent, like if it's um, intending to deceive people or um, if its intent is not focused on general like well-being of humans and the planet. How do we uh, tell? Those would be two indicators. How do we tell? I mean, I think that's up to our our judgment, our best judgment, right? Um, we don't always tell. Um, and um, This is a problem. Our own judgment is a problem, always, right? Our own judgment is always a problem. So I, yeah. one, of the, and, one of the things I was thinking about is that if our, a, a quote-unquote good pluralist could never win an office, a uh, political office, uh, because to win political office, you have to know the right answer uh, and, you know, convince people that mm -hmm. you know the right answer. Right. And that there Whereas is a right a, answer. Right. That there is a right answer yeah. even. Mm -hmm. And and I know it and I'm certain, um, which is, you know, very different from the pluralist who's more like a stoic almost, right? Uh, and yeah, in what sense? Like a stoic. Well, forget I said stoic. I don't, we won't have to talk about <laughs> stoicism, but sort of accepting things um, as they are, right? Uh, it's more, maybe more like a Buddhist, we'll say, mm. than a stoic. How about that? Is that a better yeah, analogy? Yeah, um, that's interesting. Um, there, I mean, there is definitely something when you when you get into that pluralist mindset. There is something that like eases up in you. Like there's something sort of. Oh yeah, it does feel not, like a burden has been lifted almost sometimes, right? Yeah, where it's like you don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to like you. You're not with pluralism, right? It's not like eventually we're going to get to the truth, like the right theory, right? It's like the one true yeah, theory, talk, right? Um, talk about that more because you go into some depth uh, on that. So, yeah, what does this mean for the future of science? Are we going to figure it all out? Yeah. So, uh, like the idea with using a pluralist approach is not just to like you know, be covering all our bases and, you know, make sure we're including the theory that ends up being the one true theory. Um, the idea is uh, that uh, pluralism is permanent. Um, it's not something that is going to go away. Um, right. We're not. And that doesn't mean you can't say um, you can't make statements that are true. Right. But they're always true mm -hmm. according to some theory. Um and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I don't know where, we, where we're going in with the future. Uh, but you've, part, you've talked but. about so that there is no – there basically will, will be no end um, in, in principle. Right. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. So that's my, my no end principle. Yeah. The no, yeah. The no, about, sorry. I forgot that it was called to? the no end principle. Yeah. What is the no end principle? Well, it's kind of a funny, funny yeah. name for it. I don't know if that's what it should be called. I mean, it, it definitely captures what it is, I think, but – Right, the idea that there is no there is no end to uh, the scientific discoveries and creations that we as, as humans can uh, make, and um, there's no uh, no end in the sense of like there's no final stage at which we like figured it all out, right? And we I don't think we want that either, um, right? We think we want we we seem to think we want that, uh, but I mean, that just means like all avenues are closed. There's nothing new for us, right? And the world, I mean, the universe is expanding, right? At least in some well, sense. Well, I mean, according to some mainstream theory. <laughs> according to some mainstream theory. Um, well, time is continuing, right? And things are unfolding, right? And uh, things that uh, we've never considered might be uh, worth considering in the future. Um I mean, and too, like we go back and forth right, between what theories are true. One of my favorite phenomenon is that old historical ideas that have either been discarded or forgotten um, tend to come back uh, and get rediscovered. And um, I shouldn't say this without like definitive examples coming to mind, but it's always like some historical figure that used to think this way 
and then it went away. <laughs> and now we've discovered some things, and lo and behold, it connects to that past thing very well. And I'm not sure if this idea connects to your oscillations idea, uh, fringe mainstream oscillations idea, but maybe uh, does it, uh, does what yeah, I just totally. said connect? Oh, maybe you could reflect totally, on, totally. on how so, it does then. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, with like even like heliocentrism, right, there were ideas that the sun was the center of the solar system um, in ancient, like from ancient Greek times. Uh, I forget who it, it, it is, but you can probably do a quick Google search. Um, and, you know, then uh, we had a geocentric system, right? And then back to heliocentric, heliocentrism, right? That's the sort of oscillation that I have in mind. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, but does that necessarily mean we're going to go back to geocentrism? Uh, I, I think we can... I mean, Einstein thought, you know, that we could see things in both ways. Because of, yeah. because of relativism. Yeah. yeah. Um, and... Uh, I guess another example from physics is a wave particle duality, which uh, before mm -hmm. that was born, um, we had wave theory and particle theory or corpuscular theory. Um, and those uh, oscillated back and forth until eventually we landed on wave particle duality, like light is both a wave and a particle. Let's bring it into brain sciences or psychology. So uh, let's say telepathy. Gonna is it gonna? Are we gonna be talking about telepathy in the next hundred years as a you know scientifically meritable, scientifically studyable, uh, veritable thing? Um, so I'm not. I don't want to. Uh, You're just guess. Be the You're fringe just, theorist, no, but no. I would say yes. I'm absolutely. not saying what your opinion about telepathy is. I'm saying, do you think <laughs> that telepathy will be? Uh, become more mainstream, you know, things like telepathy, uh, things like remote viewing, let's say, things oh, that are totally. like psychological phenomena that have been posited that we now uh, kind of discard as fringe. I mean, we just know so little about this stuff is the reason we dismiss it. Like uh, you're killing remote me. viewing is out of control. It's like, right. I mean, it's amazing what these people are doing. Oh, and okay. No, I mean, yeah, it's out of control. It's like, I guess uh, the fringe sense too, right? But that's mm. when you don't know anything about it. Right. Mm -hmm. When you actually like read up on it, it's like they're, you, you know, they're not just uh, putting some guy in a room and saying what's in this envelope. Right. I mean, they did do that. Uh, CIA did that. Uh, but uh, they're like having like multiple people come in a room and each of them remote view some specific uh, geological coordinates and then using each of their reports. um to put together a single report of like what's at mm -hmm. that location. Um, and they've, I mean, people used remote viewing to discover um, Cleopatra's palace. And like the, the, there's some academic, he won't say who he is, but uh, a guy who uh, is an expert in remote viewing has been like brought in to help him find like Columbus's ships. Um, okay. So, I mean, this is a real thing yeah. um, and could happen, could, could become mainstream. What's your take on the recent rise in um, hallucinogenic usage uh, mm. for... So what's going on when we uh, take one of the 600 recent hallucinogens, you know, MDMA, mescaline? Are we uh, connecting with the universe or is something happening in our brains to think that we're connecting with the universe and the collective unconscious and so on? Sorry, I'm throwing out fringy terms to you. I th no, that's great. I mean, I think I think it's important to be able to think in all these different ways, right? To uh, sort of look at it from the mainstream perspective of like this is just mm -hmm. hallucination, and being able to move from that to thinking about like, oh, I'm getting in touch with the source, or um, yeah, I don't know what's what are some other theories here. I mean, it being like a treatment for depression. Right. Yeah, it's ma major depression, and th this actually um, alludes to your po points that you've made that ancestral knowledge, speaking of hallucinogens, right, uh, comes back uh, to the fore. And um, and by the way, indigenous peoples, right, that's that's a group that we uh, suppress as fringe. Is that, do I have that right? Yeah. So uh, a lot of indigenous knowledge is, I mean, yeah, indigenous science too is like very marginalized, right? It's not... Um, Part of it is it's not necessarily done according to the same standards, right? And there's a lot of like spiritual aspects that um, indigenous people want to include um, and do include. Um, 
So it, it's not the kind of thing that like can get accepted to nature, right? Or whatever. Um, mm. But I mean, more and more, it's like we're, you know, sort of like picking and choosing the aspects of indigenous science that we like and like, you know, reappropriating them for our Western mindset. Right. <laughs> good drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Including good drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Including for, uh, for that example. there's this yeah. that actually uh, is really interesting. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, like so far, it's not like we're like, oh, we're we've found ayahuasca gets us in touch with the source. Right. It's like, uh, or I, I guess let's talk sure. about um, psilocybin. Right? It's not that that gets us in touch with um, some deeper reality. Right? It's that uh, it um, sort of allows you to detach from yourself in a way that might uh, lead you to have less mm -hmm. symptoms of depression, right? Like it's, that's the way we end up like reappropriating is like for our own interests and needs, which are not the same as like what indigenous peoples are right? in some cases at least. And uh, are you, are you a woman? Yeah. So uh, because she or they, she or they, so women also marginalize. Let me, before we talk about that, do I need to actively silence something to um, be part of the problem? Um, or is like, is indifference part of the problem also or uh, lack of interest? Like, do I need to I think be the gatekeeper that's actively marginalizing? Yeah, I think you have to, uh, I think the active silencing is the problem that at least as I see it. Um, okay. It's the like explicit, uh, statements as you know that's pseudoscience um, or like that's not real science um, mm -hmm. or whatever like anything people say in order to affect or in order that the effect is like the theory is not taken seriously like and especially I mean authorities are responsible for like anybody who's taken to be a authority in some discipline right is uh, the most responsible here for not saying things mm -hmm. like that um, yeah, so I'm, I, I definitely don't think like you're silencing if you choose not to read up on a fringe theory, um, right. That's just right. a matter of your interest and choice. Before, before I say this next thing, I just, I would be amiss if I didn't, for those who are only listening, if you're watching, this is very obvious, but especially coming off of talking about psychedelics, there are beams of light rays emanating from uh, behind Laura right now, so it's 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 quite mystical visually. So if you're only listening, you can uh, kind of imagine. Um, so okay, I just had to put that in there because it was very appropriate to the uh, yeah. They're like little rainbows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so so sorry. So backing up, I mean, you write about how women have been uh, one of the more marginalized groups of scientists, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that the case? So, so in in that case, we're talking about your you know, uh, marginalization uh, uh, regarding fringe scientists and fringe theories. Uh, is that the case in philosophy as well? Are women philosophers more likely to be silenced, marginalized? This is troubled waters for me, so I'm trying to tread lightly. Ooh, yeah. Um, yeah, troubled waters for all of us. Uh, I would say yes, um, that was a, there is. Okay. There is marginalization um, of similar kind happening in philosophy. Um, I mean, part of it, like, what I hear people talk about with, like, as being a woman are things more like, oh, wow, you're so articulate, or like, oh, you know, where it's like... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, that's I mean, like... For a woman. You yeah. Mean, for a woman. Where yeah. it's like, you know, like, you wouldn't be saying that to me, or... I mean, that's not one that I get. That's the one I've heard people talk about where it's like... Well, of course, you don't get it. No, I'm not articulate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I meant. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think... I mean, I, you definitely see that like uh, most philosophy departments and really actually philosophy of science, you get mostly men. Um, Is that still true? I mean, they're trying to change it, right? It's like you want to meet the 50-50 uh, expectation, right? But... Do you? All right. Do you? We're yeah. In trouble. Huh? Yeah. Because, so I think that opportunity wise, you definitely do. Um, and of course, this is just opinion, but I, I just think it's 
absurd to enforce an outcome of 50-50 because you're not taking into consideration people's interests. You're not uh, uh, opportunity. Yes. Because then yeah. you're allowing anyone who's interested to have the opportunity. But if zero women are interested, why would you force 50% of the population of anything to be? Yeah. Given? Yeah. Well, so you might think like there are just less women that are interested in philosophy of science. But I think part, I didn't say that. I'm, I'm uh, just saying a very yeah, abstract yeah, at, level at an abstract for any level. program. Um, yeah. So you might, um, yeah. So I mean, maybe it's just you know you want the same, you want equal opportunities offered to everyone who is interested. I think that's fair. Uh, but I think also like some of the reason people aren't interested is because they don't think they are the type of person who uh, could succeed in that field. Um, like one of the things I do is like right. show my yeah. students like pictures of all the different authors they're reading so they can see like, oh, that looks like me or like, you know, where it's like, okay, they're not like philosophers aren't just old white men with beards, right? They're, uh, they look mm. a lot of different ways. Uh, okay, good. So I, I but I, I really, I just wanted to talk about how, uh, there are certain types of overrepresented, marginalized scientists, right, or uh, theorists. Um, so, and so, I wanted to highlight that because um, that's something that you focus on, uh, and and also that uh, that it's not the the quote unquote extreme pluralism that I'm, you know, I termed it extreme pluralism, but your your brand of, of pluralism doesn't include, uh, you know, intentionally. Uh, harmful or fraudulent right. um, theories. However, the, but it always comes back to human judgment, uh, I would argue. And I, I don't see like a clear cut path forward for judging these things in a, in a way, right? So I kind of go back and forth, like, because on some level, we have to also trust our intuitions, which means not to trust anyone or anything. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, at some point, you do. it does come down to uh, human judgment. I mean, for me, like, uh, I think, uh, having an honor statement that, you know, says I'm doing, uh, science to benefit, uh, humanity and the planet or whatever the universe, if, if that's how far you go, um, is enough. Um, and from there, it's like, people have to like, like but you could much, like flag a certain theory as like, this looks uh, morally suspect or this looks um, harmful. And it's, but yeah, I mean, again, it's like, you're not, I, I yeah, I can't give you like the perfect um, solution. Yeah. Right. Cause who gets to flag it and right. And if I'm a trickster, yeah, totally. I could, yeah. I could write an yeah. honorary statement get in. and get away with it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So what I want to know is like, what is the, like, if I want to, uh, go down historically as having been a fringe theorist, <laughs> it sounds like there's a recipe. Become an expert in one field and have yeah. credentials yeah. in one field, right? And then stray from that field uh, and, and make some claims totally. in another field that are outside of yep. the mainstream. But is that always the case? Because it seems like there should be, you know, fringe uh, theorists should have all sorts of different qualities. There shouldn't just be a a specific path are those just the ones that we're paying attention to mm. and that we like because they make for good stories uh or jump out historically or do we have a sense of like where we should aim if we want to be that type of person i think yeah i think part of that is uh because they're coming from uh one field and uh, making claims about another field um the people who uh in the field that they're from right will maybe have some sympathies Right. So you might get uh, a community of people. Um, right. I mean, this is totally common, right? That fringe theories are taken up by popular audiences. They're not just uh, doesn't it's not just academics uh, hating on them. Right. It's um, right. There are people who actually believe these things. Um, and I think, yeah, I think coming from another field might give you a certain audience. Um, but I don't I don't want to say like that's the only th only way to become fringe. I mean, there's certainly two people who don't have any, uh, you know, degree and are coming up with fringe theories. So let's say I uh, never went to high school, never 
opened a math book. You know, I have no education. I was not, I'm not self-educated. I just have lived out in the forest, right? And, and I know some rudimentary English. If I come and I have no malintent, I have no intent to lie, and I come with the theory that the stars are made of a poisonous, um, uh, I don't, a poisonous, that they're actually, no, that the stars are actually um, Holes tornadoes. Oh, tornadoes. Go, go ahead. <laughs> I was trying to come up with something outlandish. What did you Holes say? Holes in the night sky. Holes in the night sky and are basically collections of uh, teeth, right? Uh-huh. Um, that's my theory. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. And is that a valid theory? Do we, uh, do, does, do your limits of pluralism include that? Uh, if you're serious, if you're dead serious about it. Yes. Um, so, and then you would have, you would probably have observations that make you think that like maybe some teeth fell out of the sky on your head one day. Um, right. Or something. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. right. And, or that's how they grow. The stars are channeling the teeth oh, through. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I mean, everything in the, the universe is so connected. Made of stardust. You, know? you, you are made of stardust. Oh my gosh, we're really, we're really <laughs> going, going out the deep end. We're getting Not, in the weeds. No, I didn't mean that in a derogatory <laughs> way. But, but you know, you, you get what I'm saying because some things just don't smell right, right? So I, I feel like I have a good bullshit meter. And I don't know whether I do, but I, I think I do. And so if someone, you know, some kid came up and said, hey, uh, stars are just collections of teeth. I would, you know, and he believed it. He obviously believed it. I would think, well, you know, uh, maybe you should have some more DMT or whatever, ayahuasca or, you know, or um, basically I would, I would kind of discard, not discard it, it would just be, yeah. I would be indifferent to it. And I would kind of be upset if um, that idea was put on the same footing as other ideas about uh, how, what stars I mean, I think are, somebody would have reasons for thinking that. Um if they thought that. I know, but, that's the, the, I know that you probably have conversations like this all the time. And I'm sorry, because I'm kind of putting you, I'm kind of asking you to stretch a little bit, right? And I don't want to be putting you into a corner. Well, I mean, or, so I think, know. yeah, a theory like that isn't on the same footing because it's not going to get uptake and attention, right? People are just going to be like, I don't care about that. That's it's not interesting. That doesn't make any sense to me. My brain can't get on board. But we should index it in the in the encyclopedia. Yeah. So it needs to take some room in our – if if I yeah. want to study stars then, that needs to take some room in my head um, as I'm trying to Not learn Not in your stars. head, uh, in the database. Yeah, but if I'm, if I'm interested in studying stars, I need to go to that database, right? And that's going to be in the database. You might, you might, see, it, you might see it in that database. But this is part yeah. of why I want like uh, or suggest having like an upvoting system, right? That's social though. And I, it is. Basically, if a thing on social media gets a ton of upvotes – it is clear indication to ignore it for me. Mm. Even if it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's a, big, okay. it's a contrarian viewpoint, right? Cynical and contrarian. Yeah. But, no, totally. It uh, means, uh, yeah, for me, I'm like consensus. That's uh, not what we're looking for. That's actually a problem. All right, Laura. So I, I don't want to take more of your time. Did we, did we miss anything that you wanted to uh, chat about? We, we never really talked about the cerebellum. So I'm not sure. That's okay. No, next time. Next time. Okay. Yeah. All right. When, once I some... do my case study on that, we can talk about that. Very good. Um, what we didn't say is that I work in the building next to you, and you and I are going to go, what What are we going to do, psilocybin? Lots of psilocybin <laughs> together around <laughs> campus and stuff? <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Thank you so much for the, the time. I, I find the work really interesting, and it, as listeners maybe um, and, and viewers can tell, that um, it's a difficult topic. And Oh, you know what? Let me, can I ask you this before before we go? What kind of feedback are you getting from other philosophers and or from scientists on these ideas? I, mean, I can imagine scientists being angry, right? Or upset to the le- at the least. Yeah. I mean, so you actually get a lot of scientists who are like, oh my God, thank God you're saying this. Like I've been, good. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I thought that uh, COVID was a lab leak for a long time. And like only recently that's been like accepted. And just like the amount of ridicule I got for just saying that is just, you know, people like, were scared of me. Um, and mm. like, you know, so scientists have actually been really receptive, I guess, especially when they're um, really steeped in like whatever they're doing and they end up with in some place that is like not acceptable. Um, and I actually, you know, I get a lot of pushback, but uh, mostly from people who are like on board with the general idea. Like what I get pushback on is like kind of the things you were giving me some pushback on, like really we should include everyone. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I don't draw. I don't draw a line. What is the? I'm sorry, I keep asking you questions. What? I promise this is the last one. What is the lesson for moving forward? Um, the reason. So the re, here's here's where I'm coming from. Um, I'm often asked, you know, what I've changed my mind about, or I often ask guests, you know, what you've changed your mind about. And often someone is, whether they've changed their mind or not, and usually they haven't, it, they're coming from a very particular point of view. But when I ask them the question, what did you change your mind about? This assumes that they had an opinion in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. And what I kind of feel like I have done, and I've, uh, I've been told I'm a very opinionated and a judgmental person, so this does not accord. There's some cognitive dissonance with the way I've think of myself versus the way that I'm uh, um, judged, uh, viewed by other people. But I kind of think of it in terms of I never really had a hard opinion about anything theoretically in neuroscience, for example, I'm uh -huh. saying, right? And and is it better to go in uh, with a beginner's open, beginner's mindset open to lots of different theoretical interpretations? Or is it better to go in um, under a very, you know, a certain theory so that you can compare it to all of the other valid theories. Does that question make sense? And do you have an answer? It, it does make sense. And I think uh, both both of those techniques could be uh, useful in different ways, right? I mean, it helps to have a theory in mind um, because you can see where is it falling short. I guess kind right. of coming in with like a blank slate might uh, make you a little bit less better off. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. but could be interesting too, like coming in without, um, any certainty about which theory is best, right? And theories are, can be good for like different ends rather than it being like a theory is better than another theory, just simpliciter, right? It's like a theory is better because it helps you, uh, avoid, uh, earthquakes or, right? That was like one of the reasons continental drift was better mm -hmm. than, uh, fixism. Right, so allowing certain, um, allowing for certain things that uh, we as humans find important and useful, right, would uh, be a reason to go with one theory over another, um, but not uh, permanently, just like in this particular for this particular mm -hmm. end, right? So I guess that's kind of like a pragmatist view, uh, but also, yeah, I don't know, going in with the blank slate. Yeah, though. you can't. There's no such thing as a blank slate, right? You, no, totally, you right? You've got to have something. Yeah. All right, Laura. Well, I'm not, I'm not really sure what we did here today, but I had fun speaking with you. <laughs> and I hope if nothing else, this is a very different kind of uh, podcast episode for Brain Inspired. And I hope if nothing else, uh, it inches um, or influences, you know, a handful of listeners to think a little bit more pluralistically, if not your extreme version. But I really appreciate you spending the time with me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Paul. It's been really great. Yeah. People can get off the bus at Super Fringe if they want. <laughs> Okay. Good. <laughs> Good. I alone produce Brain Inspired. If you value this podcast, consider supporting it through Patreon to access full versions of all the episodes and to join our Discord community. Or if you want to learn more about the intersection of neuroscience and AI, consider signing up for my online course, NeuroAI, The Quest to Explain Intelligence. Go to braininspired.co to learn more. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. You're hearing music by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you, thank you for your support. See you next time. <laughs>